Now, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. The book of Judges is, it is a history lesson on the Israelites' struggle for holiness in the new land of Canaan. You see, the Israelites came across, and they had some great battles and some victories, and then Joshua died, as we saw last week, and now the Israelites, they, their task was to drive out the false gods in the land of Canaan and, and also drive out the people who created those false gods and worshipped those idols. The problem is the Israelites failed. Do you remember this from last week? They failed to do so. They had a couple of victories, but then they failed in some key battles. And they became so ingrained in the culture of Canaan that they became mirror images of the very people that they were supposed to drive out from the land. This entire book is about Israel's wrestling with holiness, yet there was an ever-present temptation of idolatry. The book of Judges, you might know it as the book of cycles. It, really simple, there was a circular motion for the people in the book of Judges. The Israelites were constantly in a cycle, this spiritual cycle that, that was spiritual in nature, but it drastically affected their way of life in the land of Canaan. You'll see it every time you see the phrase, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Every time the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, it begins a new cycle that we will read about in the book of Judges. Now, what, this, what does this mean, that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord? It's re really simple. It means that they began to worship idols. They worshiped the Lord. They're Hebrews, after all. They're, they're from the line of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They, they worship the God of creation, but they also began to worship idols. And that, in the eyes of the Lord, is evil. And evil always must be punished. The next part of the cycle is punishment. Punishment is God's way of letting the Israelites have what they want. We talked last week about how harsh it seems that God deals with his people in the book of Judges, but like, if, if you think about it, like, what God does to his people is pretty genius. When he punishes them, he gives them over to the people who created the idols to begin with. And so God says, okay, you want to worship the cow? Fine, go and be ruled by the people who worship the cow. Fine, you want to raise up Asherah poles and, and worship these poles, these goddesses of false religions? Then fine, you can be oppressed by the very people who have created these false gods. So God's punishment is for the people to be oppressed by their enemies. The next part of the cycle is really simple, <laughs> and it's human nature. When things don't go our way, most often we cry about it. And my handwriting is on point today, let me tell you. We cry about it. And the people of Israel, they cried out to God, why are we suffering? God, why would you put us in this position? Lord, where are you? And God is faithful, and he loves his people. And he listens to their cries and eventually comes to their rescue by appointing a judge. And God gives them a judge or like a regional governor, if you will, who is going to rise up and remind the people of God and his holiness and lead them in a military conquest. So God gives them these judges. The judge comes through and they are redeemed. They are free from their oppressors and they worship God and they remember his goodness and his holiness and things are great. And for a time they have peace among each other and in the land and peace between themselves and their creator God until the judge dies and their leader goes to the grave and the people slowly forget about God and they slide back into the cultural norms of Canaan and they do evil in the eyes of the Lord again. And so then they are oppressed and punished and then they cry out to God and the judge is raised up and they are freed from their oppressors and then the judge dies and they forget and they fall back into idolatry and they do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Six times this happens in the book of Judges. Six times we see the Israelites are in this cycle of sin, punishment, repentance, deliverance, 
and sin again. And every time you end one of the cycles, you think to yourself, okay, man, like, they finally got it. They finally figured it out. They're, they're going to follow God. They learned their lesson until they don't. And they do evil again in the eyes of the Lord. It's this cycle over and over again for the Israelite people. And six times this happens. And we see from the very beginning the downward trajectory of the Israelite morality. Like in Judges 1, remember last week we started and and we saw that together they were a united nation of Israelites who were fighting against their enemies to rid the land of idolatry. But by Judges 19, we see that they are a divided group of Israelites fighting against their own brothers who have perpetuated idolatry in the land. And so God has to do something. This is why God raises up these judges. Israel had become so intertwined with the pluralistic culture of the land. And what I mean by pluralistic is that they believed they could worship more than one God at a time. Pluralism. They had become so ingrained in the pluralistic culture that they were becoming indistinguishable from the very nations they were sent to drive out of the promised land. And God sent the judges to redeem them. In the past, it was Moses who led the people out of Egypt. And then it was Joshua who led them into the land of Canaan. Now, God will raise up individuals on a case-by-case basis throughout the book of Judges. And God uses some unqualified, unlikely people to accomplish his work in this world. I mean, these people who were unqualified and unlikely to do this mission, they were were messy people. They were ordinary. They, They didn't come from great wealth. Some of them were lowly, scared, pessimistic people. Yet God chose these men and women for a purpose, and each one of them would stand firm in the belief of who God was, lead the people back to purity in worship, and redeem them from their enemies. The judge we meet today is in Judges chapter 6. His name is Gideon. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Judges chapter 6. We're going to be in this chapter all morning long. Gideon... Gideon was a man who lived in a region that was dominated by the Midianites. The Midianites, they were the enemies against the Israelites at this time. One way to remember the Midianites is that there were so many of them, you could call them the many anites There were multitudes of these people. And they were, they were oppressing the Israelites in a very unique and strategic way. You see, the Israelites were so oppressed that they had been driven away from their land and they were living up in the cracks of the mountains to hide from the Midianite oppressors. They were living up in the mountains, hiding from the Midianites, because every season their enemies would enter into their farmlands and destroy their crops. At every planting season, every, every sowing season, the Israelites would plant their fields, and then the Midianites, with their multitudes of people and multitudes of camels and other livestock, they would come into the land and stamp out the ground before the seed could even take in the soil. What they were doing was strategically starving the Israelites to death as they lived up in the mountain countries. And Gideon is up there in the mountains just with all of the others starving to death. And that's when we meet him in Judges chapter 6 in verse 1. We know that this is the start of the fourth cycle in Judges. The fourth, sin against God, punishment, crying about it. The judge comes and they're free. This is the fourth cycle in the book. This is what it says in verse one. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They worshiped idols. And so for seven years, God handed them over to their Midianite enemies. They worshiped the gods of the land, and then they were oppressed by the people who created those false gods. Now we're going to read the next steps of the cycle in the coming verses. We meet Gideon as he is up in his father's storehouse. In Judges 6, verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord came down and sat under a tree on his father's land. Joash is his father. There, Gideon was threshing the wheat in the winepress to keep it and hide it from the Midianites. 
Okay, just from this one verse, I'm going to Bible nerd out on you for just a second. You with me? In this one verse, we see that everything I've said so far is factually accurate. The people of Israel were living in a dire situation. And Gideon, Gideon is displaying how dire it really was. He was threshing the wheat where the wine press was located. So what little food they did have, Gideon had to take it and prepare it in a secret place so as to hide from his enemies who might show up at any moment and steal their food supply out from under them, leaving them to starve to death even faster. Gideon was conditioned to be afraid of his enemies. And that's where Gideon is. And at the same time, we meet the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord came and sat under the tree on his father's property. The angel of the Lord. This is a very unique interaction. The scripture would indicate that this is actually God himself who came down, was incarnate in the form of a man, and sat under the tree face to face with Gideon. We know this because Gideon refers to the angel of the Lord as Lord numerous times in this passage. He calls the angel Lord. Lord is the personal name of God in the Hebrew scriptures. And that is not a title given to any other angel or spiritual being, only to the creator God. And Gideon calling the angel Lord indicates to us that this is a a pre-incarnate Christ. It's not Jesus of Nazareth. Don't misunderstand me. It's not the the boy born of a virgin who grew up in Nazareth who would do his ministry in Galilee. It's not Jesus, the physical man, but it is a pre-incarnate person of the Trinity. It is God in the flesh with Gideon under the tree. And if you're a super Bible nerd, maybe you're tracking with me. This sounds a whole lot like when when Abraham met with the Lord under the tree centuries before in the very land of Canaan. It also sounds like when Moses had his moment with the Lord at the burning bush and Moses heard from the Lord that he would be the deliverer. And these stories also mirror each other in the way that Gideon was nervous and anxious and afraid to do the work of God. But here is the angel of the Lord under the tree at the house of Gideon's father. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord said to Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Man, that'd be a really nice intro, wouldn't it? If God came down and sat across from you and called you a mighty warrior because God is with you. Now, Gideon may have had a lot of nicknames growing up, but I can guarantee you this, mighty warrior was not one of them. (laughs) This man was not mighty. In fact, he was scared to death of everything. He was always worried, always looking over his shoulder. He was conditioned to be afraid of his enemies who were in the valley below. I would describe Gideon as a worst-case scenario kind of thinker. You know, he's always seeing into the future and thinking, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to me, and how can I prevent that thing from happening to me? When you operate out of fear... You are not called a mighty warrior. Yet the Lord comes to Gideon and says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Even though Gideon was doubtful of who God is and what God can do, Gideon grew up in a religiously confused household. Maybe you can relate with that. Not not really worshiping God, our Father and Creator, with your full self, or maybe you kind of flip-flopped in and out of church. Gideon grew up in a religiously confused household. They were Hebrew people, right? We've established this from Judges chapter 1. He is a descendant of of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And and Gideon and his family, they knew the story, right? That, That Jacob had 12 sons, and then they were in Egypt, and then they were slaves, and then they were brought out, and then through the wilderness and into the promised land. They even knew the law of Moses that had been passed down through the generations. But even though they were Hebrew people, Gideon and his family also worshiped the gods of Canaan. And so he grew up in a household where they would worship the creator, but also go out back and give sacrifices to idols. In fact, we get the idea that Gideon's father was uh, maybe a, a big shot in his city that among the people in his community, he may have been wealthy or some kind of spiritual leader. Scripture says that Joash, the father of Gideon, had an altar to Baal in his backyard. You ever heard of Baal before? 
Okay, this is what I'll do. Saying Baal makes me sound really like smart, doesn't it? And it makes me feel good that you think I'm smart because I'm insecure. But I'm going to change. Instead of saying Baal, we can all accept that we are Southerners today, aren't we? We live in the South. So from now on, let's just call him Baal. Can we do that? We'll just say, everybody say it after me. I'll say Baal, then you say Baal. Baal. That's what I'm talking about, people. We're talking about Baal today. You see, Gideon's father had an altar to a false god named Baal. And the altar was out back, and you would bring a sacrifice and kill the calf and and lay it and burn it on this altar as a burnt offering to a false god who himself was represented as a cow, an idol image of a calf. Not only that, but in the backyard of his father's house, next to the altar to Baal, was an Asherah pole. It was a pole that stood up, or maybe a a tree-like symbol that represented the goddess of fertility in the land of Canaan. So this is Gideon's house, right? How confused would you be if you grew up worshiping the God of your ancestors, the Lord, but also making ceremonial sacrifices and worship to Baal and the Asherah pole? Is it any wonder why when Gideon saw the Lord face to face and was called a mighty warrior, Gideon doubted who the Lord was. He was confused. In Gideon's eyes, no God had done anything for him. He and his people had been in oppression under the Midianites for seven years. And for seven years, they had prayed to the God and the other gods that they would be freed from oppression. But year after year, their oppressors kept pushing their foot against them. In the eyes of Gideon, no God did anything for him. He was confused because of idol worship. Let me share a little secret with you. Can we just lean in a little bit? Everybody just lean forward a little bit. I just want to share a little secret with you. And, and I, I, we probably shouldn't let this get out beyond our walls. I don't, I don't want to be, like, embarrassed by anything. Let me just lean in. Can I tell you, idols are not alive. Amen. Okay, that feels good to get it off my chest, that, like, idols are not alive. You know what I'm saying? Like, idols do not breathe. They do not talk. They cannot hear. An idol created by man that represents a bigger spiritual being, like, Idols are not alive. Yet for centuries, people groups all over the world worship inanimate objects as if they are a God who is alive. I've been to places like this, like in Haiti. I've been in Haiti where you drive down the dirt roads or you walk into a hut of a local, and inside those huts or outside of the shops where the people are selling things, there might be trinkets of voodoo. They're inanimate objects, but they represent a spiritual depravity that the people are living in. And these objects are not alive. They do not breathe. They cannot speak. They cannot hear. But they are worshipped as if they are alive. We have missionaries all over the planet who are doing the Lord's work in places of this world where people still worship inanimate objects as if they are living, breathing gods. One such missionary we've been supporting as a church for many years, his name is Enoch Nidor. He and his family run a mission in Ghana, Africa. In fact, we've been supporting them so long, part of the one point, excuse me, 3.1 million, got to make sure I get that right, part of the $3.1 million that Crosspoint has sent to missionaries over the last 20 years has gone to Enoch and his family for the mission work that they do in Ghana. There's a story from years ago at his mission that a man named Hayford was traveling about doing medical evangelism. And Hayford and his doctor companion, they would go from village to village in remote areas of Ghana to bring medical supplies and treatment, but also present the gospel of Jesus to people who had never heard the news of Christ before. Well, the story goes that Hayford and his doctor companion, that they came to a village, and when they arrived, they experienced a most unusual phenomenon. When they entered the village, they quickly found a man-made mud pile that had been plastered over so that it would stand up straight in the middle 
of the village. And the villagers, they had woven together straw hats, and they had placed a hat on top of this mud pile and used more straw and sticks to poke out of this mud figure to make it look like it was a human figure. It's kind of like the reverse Frosty the Snowman. You know what I mean? Like Frosty was made out of snow. This thing was made out of mud with a straw hat and two eyes made out of rocks, I guess. I don't know. But this mud figure stood in the middle of the village and represented the village god. The people in the village literally would dance around this mud figure And they would sing worship to it, and they would bow down before it, worshiping this mud pile as if it were a living, breathing God. But you and I know it can't breathe, the mud cannot speak, and the mud certainly cannot hear the praises and worship that are being given to it. Hayford, perhaps, like you and I, we would want to go into that village and say, what what is this accomplishing for you? What is this inanimate object actually doing for you? This mud gives you no advantage in this world. Stop worshiping it. As obvious as it is for you and me that the mud is not a god, convincing others that it's not a god is much more difficult. For centuries, if you look back in history, people groups all over the world have been worshiping inanimate objects, including creatures of creation that they have melded together to create their own visualization of what God looks like. If you go back in history and look at the Egyptians, this is one particular Egyptian god. It's called Seth. I'm probably not pronouncing that in the correct Egyptian way, but it's called Seth. And Seth was the son of one of the higher-up gods in their polytheistic hierarchy. And Seth had the body of a human, but the head and a face of a donkey. And we would look at this and think those, those people way back in history, they, they, they were just like, they were dumb, weren't they? To worship this figure that looked like a donkey, but had the body of a human and made statues of it all throughout their nation. Or how about in Eastern religions in the far eastern hinduism this is a picture of a god called ganesh it has the face and the head of an elephant and the body of what looks like buddha the very large overweight god and it has two human arms and ha- excuse me four human arms and hands and two human legs and feet and this is a god that is worshiped in hinduism this idol cannot breathe, it cannot speak, it cannot hear, but it is worshipped as if it is alive. What about the Canaanites, the very people we're talking about in the book of Judges? This is a depiction of what Baal would have looked like. This is Baal, y'all, the, the calf god. And Baal was the, the big god among all the other small sidekick gods in the land of Canaan represented in two different forms here, the cow and the person. These both represent Baal and the person holding what looks like a depiction of an Asherah pole or could be the Asherah pole. This is what the people worshipped. But they were not alive. And you would look through history and think to ourselves, man, old, old... Ancient religions are just so odd to us, and the the practice of worshiping inanimate objects and idols just seems so foreign to us. But in reality, history has not changed very much, people. Even in our modern culture, we have created idols that can take the focus of our worship away from God. Let's be even more specific and say in our Western modern culture, We have created idols that take our worship away from God. Is it not obvious to us that the bronze cow on Wall Street looks a whole lot like what the Canaanites were worshiping centuries ago? This God representing financial security, it represents prosperity and striving for more and more. Not to mention that we have created elephants and donkeys of our own that become focal points of our worship every two to four years. You want to talk about a cycle of depravity? People 
Let's consider our own depravity. Just think about it. We have created idols that take our worship away from God and become the focal point of our religion. These idols may not be alive, but man, we make them alive in our own eyes because we live in a pluralistic society. We live in a culture that dabbles with worshiping the one true God, but at the same time putting our hope and faith in man-made gods. And we cannot serve both. The Lord says it himself, no other gods before me. You cannot serve both the idols of this world and God. And we have created many idols. For the Israelites in Canaan, it was gods of gluttony and drunkenness and prostitution. And for us, really, it's no different. For us, it's sex, shekels, and stomach, the unholy trinity of the self-God. It's pleasure, possession, and position, what the New Testament calls lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Or maybe it's more subtle for you. Maybe it's the subtleties of the idols of football, the firm, and family. Idolatry is anything that takes your worship away from God and becomes the focal point. Idols are everywhere. And in our pursuit of false gods, we might end up like Gideon, unable to recognize God when he stands face to face with us. In Judges chapter 6, verse 12, the angel of the Lord was standing with Gideon, and he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon responds immediately and says, pardon me, Lord, but if the Lord is with us, then why has he let all these things happen to us? Pardon me, God, but what have you done for me? I've been praying for a long time, God. Pardon me. If you're really here, like, tell me, what have you done for me and for my people? Just look at how diluted Gideon's view of God's work in the world has become. How diluted his vision of who the Lord truly is. In his eyes, God had not done anything for him, nor had any of the other idols that he had been worshiping him. And he could not trust the Lord, even though they were standing face to face. And maybe that's where you are when you came to church today. You come to church this morning skeptical, filled with doubt, not sure of who God is or really unbelieving of his work and his power in the world, much less his work and power in your own personal life. But let's be honest. When we doubt, is our doubt rooted in God's lack of intervention for us? Or is our doubt rooted in our pluralistic delusions of idolatry? Eventually, Gideon did learn to trust the Lord, but it took an awful lot of convincing to get there. <laughs> Gideon required sign after sign after sign until finally he was ready to do what the Lord had asked him to do. He was ready to trust in God fully. If you, if you look in your Bibles, Judges 6, 36 and 37, Gideon, I told you, he was scared and doubtful, always thinking about the worst case scenario. And a person like that needs constant reassurance about what is about to happen. Gideon asked for signs from the Lord and he had already seen two signs up to this point. We, we've skipped over them in the text, but if you go back and read, he saw the sign of consuming fire, that when he gave his offering, the Lord consumed it with fire there at the tree that day. He also saw the sign when his life was spared after he cut down the idols and the places of worship for the false gods in his community. God spared his life when the people wanted to kill him. That's two signs already that the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. But Gideon is getting ready to go up against the Midianites. 
He's going to lead the Israelites in this conquest of their enemies. And he starts to get cold feet. And in verse 36 and 37, Gideon goes to the Lord and he says, okay, God, like, I just need one more sign from you. I'm a little nervous about what's about to happen. I need a sign. Here's, here's what I want from you, God. I'm going to take a fleece of wool and I'm going to put it outside my tent. And tomorrow morning, God, hear me out. This is what I want you to do. Tomorrow morning when I wake up, I want the fleece to be wet with the morning dew and the ground around it to be dry. Okay, God, you got it. That's what I'm looking for. Gideon went back into his tent. The sun went down. He rolled over in bed and covered himself up. I'm sure he didn't sleep a wink that night, tossing and turning, hoping that God would answer his prayer. Maybe got a little bit of rest before the sun came up over the horizon, and he threw off the covers and opened up the flaps to his tent, and he saw the fleece and reached down, and sure enough, the fleece was wet. He could wring it out because it was still soaking wet with the morning dew, and he, he started to feel the ground around him, and sure enough, the ground around the fleece was dry. And praise the Lord, you, like you gave me the sign. You, you showed me, God, surely you will save Israel through me. And that morning, Gideon worshiped the Lord, and that's all he could think about, this miracle that happened. And midday came, and he kept thinking about what happened and by that evening, he was overthinking what had happened and began to convince himself that maybe this wasn't God who did this miracle. I mean, after all, wool is absorbent and it could have just soaked up the water around it on the ground and that's why it was wet and the ground was dry. Oh no, Lord, I need another sign. He said, God, be patient with me. I need one more sign. This is what I want. I'm going to put out a new fleece. This time, God, tomorrow morning, I want the fleece to be dry and the ground to be wet. And so Gideon put the fleece out, closed the flaps of his tent, got in bed and covered himself up. Soon the sun came up over the horizon at dawn. He threw off his covers and opened up the flaps of his tent and he saw the fleece and he reached down and sure enough, the fleece was bone dry and the ground around it was soaking wet so much he had to rinse off his hands and fling the water off. It was another miracle. God provided the sign and Gideon said, surely you will save Israel through me. Now we've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there. I think it's safe to say. I, I, I'm going to make a blanket statement because I, I'm pretty confident in this. All of us, at some point in time, if you've ever followed the Lord, you have asked for a sign. Whether it was a serious moment or you're driving down the road or just something popped into your head, all of us have asked for a sign at some point or another. But I'll be honest with you, this in Judges chapter 6 is pretty ridiculous. Like Gideon is not the model for faith here. He's not the person that we need to follow and mimic. Because the honest truth is that if you ask God to give you an answer, when he gives you the answer, you follow. Amen. Don't use the story of Gideon as an excuse to never follow through with what God has told you to do. Gideon was scared, he was filled with doubt, and he did not want to do what God had called him to do. And last week, we talked about how harsh God deals with his people. This seems harsh, but let's flip that upside down and recognize how gracious and how patient God is with his people. Not once, not twice, but five times. Gideon asked for a sign because he doubted in all five times. God was gracious and patient and answered this pitiful servant of his. I am so glad that God is patient and gracious. Amen. Because if he wasn't, I'm sure he would have thrown me out a long time ago. He would have. For my lack of trust, my lack of faith at times, and maybe you feel the same, thankful that God is patient and gracious. And God doesn't just show us his patience and grace with Gideon. He, he does it with many figures in the scripture. There was Moses. Moses, he was in exile, and he had a self-image problem. Then there was 
Gideon, who was a fearful doubter. And then there was David, who was a shepherd with no military experience and a lust problem. And then there was Peter, who was hot-headed and denied ever knowing Jesus. Then there was Paul, who was self-righteous and murdered Christians. And then there's you and me. We are the same. We are confused, lustful liars. We are drunks, manipulators, and doubters. We are scared, self-righteous, skeptics, narcissistic, insecure, unqualified, and unlikely, but you have been chosen by God to accomplish his mission on this earth. Thank you, Jesus. To love the Lord your God so radically and to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the mission Christ has sent us on. And for us, that means opening up our homes and sitting around the table as we share life together and encourage others into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It means increasing your giving so that the mission field can profit from your sacrificial lifestyle. It means becoming a missionary yourself and taking the word of God to the very ends of the earth. It means committing to serve your church outside of your comfort zone. It means standing up for your Christian belief among your coworkers and your friends and your family. And if you do these things, you might suffer socially, financially, professionally, academically, psychologically, even physically. And I know what you've said inside because I've said the same thing. You get down on your knees and you pray, Lord, if you want me to reconcile with my friend, make it so that we meet each other at the drink fountain in the cafeteria tomorrow. A sign. Lord, If you want me to give sacrificially, then give me a raise so that it makes it easier for me to do so. A sign. Lord, if you want me to share the gospel with my neighbor, make it so that they bring their garbage can down to the street at the same time I bring my garbage down to the street and we'll meet in the middle and talk about Jesus, I promise. It's a sign. Lord, give me a sign. Give me a sign. And the honest truth about Scripture is that the Bible is screaming at us that God already gave the sign. He gave the sign. God has given you the sign. 1 Corinthians 15 says it clearly. The Apostle Paul says, I have given you what was the most important news I could ever deliver to you, that Christ died on the cross for your sin. And then he was buried in the tomb. And three days later, he resurrected from the grave. And he was witnessed by Peter. And he revealed himself to the other 12. And then 500 plus people saw the resurrected Jesus standing before them. The eyewitness testimony is in. God became flesh. He lived a perfect life. He was crucified on the cross, buried in the grave, resurrected three days later, and now lives eternally at the right hand of God as the ruler of all of heaven and all of earth. And you, we need more of a sign? This is the sign. It's the greatest sign that has ever been given in the history of our earth. And if you believe it, If you believe that this miracle happened, that Jesus died and came back to life, if you believe it, then you most certainly should be able to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. This is the sign of Jesus Christ. And because of it, I will give him my full trust. Lord Jesus, I pray for the conviction of hearts right now, God, that you would move us closer to you. Jesus, you are the sign. And we look to you and you alone. I pray for salvation in this moment, this morning, God. We love you. We praise you. We pray it in your name. Amen. Do you remember the story of Hayford? medical missionary in Ghana, Africa. Hayford and his doctor companion arrived at the village of the Mud God, and they set up up their practice outside of the village underneath a tree. For days, villagers would come out and be treated for their 
medical issues and they go back home. One day, a woman came out from the village seeking help for an illness that the mud god could not cure. And it was on that day, under the cool of the shade of that tree, that she heard the good news of Jesus, that Jesus alone is our healer, both of our physical illnesses and most importantly of our spiritual illness. He heals us of our sin. That woman that day was wearing a necklace that was made of bones. It was a necklace that was a tribute to her mud god in her village. But that day, after hearing the news of Jesus, she went back to her hut, took off her necklace, and threw it away. For on that day, she decided that she would serve the Lord Jesus as her one and only God. The village chief heard about this, and you can imagine, was outraged. He left his hut and went storming out to meet and confront the men under the tree. But on that day, the chief met the Lord Jesus under the tree. And that village was never the same. There is no other God before him, and there is no God more worthy of your praises than Jesus. Today, if you are ready to follow him as your one and only God, doing away with our pluralistic delusions of idolatry, then as we sing, I invite you to come and meet with our elders in the prayer room. Come and meet with an elder of the church and pray together and learn what it means to follow Jesus with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. He is your Savior. Let all those who wish to be saved come to Jesus today. Let's stand and worship.